Hi, Adams. For today's lesson, we're going to learn about the different judges that are on Eureka. I am not going to go through all of these words because it will take me too long and I'll run out of time. So um, use these vocab words for when you're in the reading and you don't know what the word means. They're all bolded. So go back in there to find it and go find the um, definition up here. So first we have a note from George Washington Carver. Welcome, secrets. There are many ways to conduct Okay, so we're going to read about each of the judges. After we read about each inventor, you're going to fill out these six questions. So you're going to tell me what is their name, when were they born, where were they born, list the inventions they created, and then you're going to describe a challenge or disappointment that this inventor faced. So something that they struggled with or something that was difficult for them. And then the last one is any fun fact that you found interesting from the reading. So the first author, I'm sorry, the first judge and inventor we're going to read about is Thomas Edison. It says, grouchy inventor Thomas Edison returns to anchor the panel of judges on Eureka student inventor. Producers are relieved to have Thomas Edison back on the judging panel this season on Eureka. Without a big name like his, they were concerned that even fewer people would tune in. For everyone's sake, the producers hope that this season's contestants pay Edison the respect he feels he deserves. After all, many claim that Thomas Alva Edison is the most successful American inventor of all time. He patented over a thousand inventions in the United States. He had humble beginnings, however. Born on February 11, 1847 in Milan, Ohio, he was the last of seven children. His family was poor, and his education consisted mainly of being homeschooled and reading his father's books. He got his first job when he was 12 years old, selling newspapers on the Grand Trunk Railroad. In his time off, he reads in the public library and conducted chemistry experiments in the baggage cars. One of his experiments set the train on fire, but Edison wasn't deterred. Even then, he knew that you have that you often have to figure out the wrong way to do something before you can find the right way. One day, he rescued a child from the path of a moving train, and the boy's father, who was trained to operate a telegraph, offered him lessons in telegraphy. He soon became a telegraph operator, and before long, he was inventing remarkable improvements to the telegraph that got the attention of financers. With their support, he opened a laboratory in Menlo Park, New Jersey. His lab was the first of its kind. It was a busy place where experts collaborated, working on multiple inventions at the same time. Research and marketing happening under one roof. In this idea-rich environment, Edison invented the phonograph, the first device for recording sound, and the incandescent light bulb, his most famous invention. By the time he died in 1931, Edison had patented an astounding 1,093 inventions in the United States and more abroad. These also include the kinetoscope, which launched the movie industry, the microphone, the rechargeable battery, and a cement manufacturing process. Edison believes this list cements his place in history. Next, we've got Hedy Lamar. Brainy beauty Hedy Lamar reluctantly agrees to judge season two of Eureka, citing boredom and a salary that will help pay for her guilty pleasure strudel. Producers are reportedly okay with Hedy Lamar joining Eureka as a judge. For her part, Miss Lamar claims indifference about returning to the panel. Her hopes for the student contestants include that they don't give her a head cold or lice. 
Born on November 9, 1914, as Hedwig Eva Maria Keisler to Jewish parents in Vienna, Austria, Hedy Lamar changed her name in the early 1940s and became a movie star known for her stunning looks. But there was more to Hedy Lamar than starring roles in popular Hollywood films, Great Beauty, and Six Marriages. She was also an avid inventor. Her inventing began out of a need to entertain herself. She disliked Hollywood parties, so she had free time. She dedicated a room in her house entirely to inventing. Some of the things she developed there were everyday items, a better traffic signal, an improved box of Kleenex, neither of which succeeded. But some of her other inventions were advanced technologies. <clears throat> She's best known as an inventor for coming up with frequency hopping, the concept of changing the frequencies of the radio signals steering a torpedo so that an enemy would not be able to block them. She and her friend and inventing partner, a composer named George Antheil, stumbled on the idea when discussing a piece of music he'd composed that made use of synchronized player pianos. The two hoped to help America in World War II with their idea. It was acquired by the U.S. Navy, but the Navy never found a way to use it. It took 20 more years for the idea to be put to use, a major disappointment to Lamar. Today, a more advanced version of frequency hopping is used in wireless phones, GPS, anything that makes use of Wi-Fi. Lamar never profited from the idea, and she was rarely appreciated for her brilliant mind. This oversight irked her to no end and certainly contributes to her sometimes, shall we say, quick-tempered responses on Eureka. All right, we're going to go over to Skills. And we're going to read about Jacques Cousteau, lover of croissants and aquatic life, seafaring Frenchman Jacques Cousteau returns to Eureka's judging panel. Producers are frustrated that Jacques Cousteau has returned this season as a judge on Eureka, despite the fact that he was not invited back after the mess he caused last season. Jacques, however, is thrilled to be on the panel and claims that this will be Eureka's most exciting season ever. Jacques Cousteau likes excitement. Born on June 11, 1910, in the small town of St. André de Cubzac, France, Cousteau was a curious child. Although not a good student, he was always building things and taking things apart to see how they worked. At age 26, he was in a terrible car accident that required months of rehabilitation. Armed with a pair of goggles, he began swimming daily in the sea. He quickly realized that he was able to explore the ocean. But to do so, he would need better equipment for breathing underwater, so he decided to try inventing it. Cousteau and his inventing partner developed the Aqualung, which allowed people to stay underwater while breathing from air cylinders, small tanks that can hold hours worth of air. This advance opened human eyes to aquatic life in a new way, and also allowed for undersea rescues and recoveries that would have been impossible before. Cousteau also helped invent a deep water camera. As an avid undersea explorer, he wanted to share with the world what he experienced in person. He went on to lead, whoops, he increased interest in underwater archaeology by spearheading the exploration of a famous Roman shipwreck. He went on to lead many more vo explorations to write books and to make films about his voyages and about ocean life. His television series, The Undersea World of Jacques Cousteau, was so popular it ran for eight years. Jacques died at the age of 87 in Paris on land, but he was most himself when he was at sea. He once said, from birth, man carries the weight of gravity on his shoulders. He is bolted to earth, but man only has to sink beneath the surface and he is free. All right, we've got two more. So here is George Washington Carver. Peanut expert George Washington Carver joins Eureka as judge, brings love of plants, general human kindness to program. Producers are pleased to announce that well-known inventor, professor, and all-around good guy George Washington Carver has joined the cast of Eureka. Carver brings to the judging panel a love of research, a deep knowledge of plant life and agricultural inventions, and a much-needed friendly and optimistic perspective. A biography of George Washington Carver might as well be a biography of the peanut and the sweet potato. Carver arguably devoted more time, care, and love to these two crops, finding over 400 new uses for them than any person devoted to plant life before or since. The road to botany-based greatness wasn't easy, however. 
Carver was born into slavery in Diamond, Missouri around January 1864. He wasn't sure of his exact birth date. He could not enroll at the first college to which he'd been admitted because of his race. When he finally started college in 1890, he studied painting and drawing and piano because his school, Simpson College in Iowa, did not have a science program. But these studies led him back to science and nature when an instructor was impressed by his pictures of plants. The instructor pointed Carver toward Iowa State Agricultural College's botany program, where he was the first black student. This is where his unlikely career took root. He was a talented botanist and was soon hired to lead the prestigious Tuskegee Institute's agricultural department. While at Tuskegee, Carver set out to help struggling farmers and sharecroppers in the South. He worked hard to get the latest information about farming methods to them, even in remote locations, to help them remain self-sufficient. Until this time, farmers in the South had produced mostly cotton. Carver helped to introduce many more cash crops, crops that could be sold for money. He also instructed farmers to grow crops that broke down the soil, such as cotton, one year and then the next year to grow crops that improve the quality of the soil, such as peanuts, sweet potatoes, peas, and soybeans. This method of crop rotation kept the soil rich and fertile. Carver became an inventor when he turned his attention to finding new uses for some of these crops. He developed countless paints, dyes, and plastics made from peanuts, sweet potatoes, pecans, and soybeans. And of course, he is often credited with inventing, or at least popularizing, peanut butter. When asked why he didn't try to make a personal profit from his inventions, he said, God gave them to me. How can I sell them to someone else? All right, we got one more note from George. Good work. All right, we got one more. This is Ruth Wakefield. Good day, children. I am Ruth Graves Wakefield, and I am so very pleased to have the opportunity to clear up some disappointing untruths that people have written over the years about me and the invention of the chocolate chip cookie. Whoops, too far. I was born June 17th, 1903 in East Wapole, Massachusetts. Articles about me almost always get that right, at least, but then the stories people tell. Here are some of the false stories that exist about me on the internet. Some have claimed that the invention of America's favorite cookie was an accident. They say I ran out of nuts and in panic chopped up a Hershey bar to throw into the cookie dough. It's utter nonsense. I kept a strict inventory of my food pantry's contents and would certainly have noted an absence of pecans, cashews, or our own Professor Carver's peanuts um, in prior to the dinner rush. I have also read that I mistakenly spilled chocolate chunks into the cookie dough after being startled by a malfunctioning mixer. Having spent most of my life in kitchens, including my college years, during which I studied the household arts, I assure you that my response to a broken appliance would have been mild irritation, followed by a call to the repairman. Here's the truth about my cookie. It may not be the most thrilling story in the world, but I can't concern myself with that. In 1930, my husband Kenneth and I opened a restaurant near Boston called the Toll House Inn. The inn was my pride and joy, and I took its operation very seriously. Some, may, some have suggested I was a bit of a tyrant with the staff, and I don't deny it. If a waitress wasn't able to fold a napkin exactly right, I would suggest that perhaps her skills were better suited to one of those greasy spoons. Yes, I wanted my restaurant to be the best, and I'm fairly certain that's no crime. Therefore, I was always trying to come up with new dishes and desserts to attract more business, so I set out, quite deliberately, to invent a new cookie. And after some trial and error with different ingredients, I created the chocolate chip cookie in 1938 by improving a butterscotch cookie already on the menu. That's all there is to it. And while I know quite well that my cookie did not change the course of history, I'll leave you with this question. If you were stranded on a desert island, which would you have... Which would you prefer to have with you, a box of light bulbs or a box of chocolate chip cookies? All right, so you guys are going to write your six different facts about each inventor, and I will see you all tomorrow. Bye, Adams.